In the last section of the book, we looked at density and mass. And so it's kind of natural in this section to look at the center of mass of an object. You may remember this topic from integral calculus. Um, some of you might have covered it, some of you might not have. Uh, the center of mass of an object is something you're kind of intuitively, intuitively familiar with. In lots of problems, in lots of physics type problems, it's a point at which you can think of all the mass of an object being concentrated. So, you know, the center of the mass of the Earth, you know, you sometimes think of the Earth as a point mass uh, with all that mass concentrated at its center. Um, you, the center of mass of an object, well, it's what you, where you put your finger under to make it balance. I'm, yeah, right, so the center of mass is, is located here. Somewhere there, we don't know the Z coordinate of the center of mass, it better be lying over my finger somewhere. Um, the center of mass of an object doesn't have to be located on the object, which kind of means that you wouldn't be able to balance such an object. The easiest example of such a thing is probably an annulus. Uh, take, a, take a, think of a thin metal disc and then remove a smaller metal disc from it. And if you, if you have some, a, something like that, then the, the center of mass, by symmetry, the center of mass is, well, at the center of the missing disk. So if you had a metal ring with a, with a hole in the center, there'd be no place where you could, but it's pretty intuitively clear. There's no place where you can put your finger to make the ring balance. I don't want to go into the physics um, of why the center of mass is located where it is. Um, that is in the more depth portion of the section. But we're going to start out assuming that we know where the center, how to calculate center of mass for a collection, a finite collection of point masses, and then you use that to, and you, you use that with your infinitesimal thinking or chopping things up into little pieces and Riemann sums to pass to solid objects with infinite numbers of points in them. So um, we're just going to assume it's given that we know the situation for a bunch of point masses, a finite number though. So you've got some idealized point masses in space. So we're thinking of, oh, here's some, some mass that's located at this point. Here's some mass that's located at this point. You get the idea. And, and their coordinates, we're thinking of an x sub one, x, y sub one, z sub one. Um, which we'll just call the, its position vector or multi-coordinate um, and r sub, r sub 1. So you've got, and of course, for each one of these, it's, we have a mass of mi located at some position ri, so this is and xi, yi, zi. Then the center of mass, the, the position of the center of mass, RCM, so this is the, the center of mass. Of course, it has three coordinates. And it's just you take. The sum over as i goes from 1 to however many masses you had, however many point masses you had. You take the position vector, so maybe I'll just write ri, mi, and divide by the total mass, which is the sum of the masses. Um, I've done something I've tried to avoid in the past. I've put mi is a scalar, and I've got scalar multiplication on the right instead of on the left. Uh, hopefully that doesn't bother you too much. In a minute, we're going to have the integral form of this, and it's just natural to have the mass on the right, because it'll be dm. And so um, what does this mean? It means you know, the, the x, y, and z components of the center of mass, which are usually denoted by yeah, bars, you put bars over x, y, and z, that you calculate those by putting 
xi, yi, and zi here, which means that x bar is the sum of xi times mi divided by the total mass, and y, y bar is the sum of yi times mi divided by the total mass, and, and z bar is the, the sum of the zi times, M, zi times mi divided by the total mass. All right, that's what you do for a finite number of point masses. So what do you do for a solid object, which consists of an infinite number of point masses? We do what we always do when we're integrating. We think about taking a solid object and chopping it up into little pieces, and you think of each one of those pieces as a point mass, and you pick some point in it and use the location of that point as the location vector. And so you instantly transform this into x bar, y bar. So for a solid object, So for a solid object, and now I'm being a little sloppy. <laughs> if I, in the book, I'm more technically accurate. A solid, a solid object occupying a region S in R3, and I'm just calling the solid object S here. I'm not distinguishing between the object and the region in space which it occupies. I don't think that'll cause you a problem. For a solid object S in space, you have the position of the center of mass, which we still denote by x bar, y bar, and z bar, it's the summation becomes a triple integral over s. The position vector, the position point, this becomes your general x, y, and z. The mi becomes the infinitesimal amount of mass at that point, and you divide by the triple integral over S of just dm. So this will give you the total mass of the solid object. You add up all the little blobs of mass. And this gives you, you know, this says x bar. You take the triple integral over S of x times dm and divide by the total mass. But how do you calculate dm? Typically, you would be given a density function. So suppose you have a solid object that's in space with density, you know, as we did in the last section, with density delta equals delta x, y, z. So the, perhaps the density may vary with x, y, and z. And it could be a function of, of where you are. And then to calculate this, well, the dm, as we saw in the last section, dm, once you've got a density function, is delta times dv. And so that's what maybe I won't even rewrite it. It's just here you get delta times dv. And here you get delta times dv. Um, so this is what you do to calculate the center of mass given a density function. Um, a very nice case, and the most common case, is where the density function is actually constant. So this is what you do for the center mass. And one nice thing about it is, since you're integrating over the same solid both places, you can use the same limits of integration. That's nice. But what if the density is constant? So um, suppose the density is constant. And of course, greater than zero, or the whole problem is you know, silly. Then what happens? All right, this is the general formula where the density function could, be a f could depend on x, y, and z. But if delta is a constant, then you can pull this delta out of the integral, and you can pull this delta out of the integral. And then those deltas cancel. And this is just the total volume. So what are you getting? Well, the deltas cancel. So the x, x bar, y bar, and z bar, the x, y, and z coordinates of the center of mass, 
don't depend on the density if it's constant. They, that means they just depend on the shape. And in this context, you call the x, y, and z coordinates of the center of mass, you call, well, you call the center of mass, this is the centroid. So the centroid is the center of mass of the object if the object has if the object has uniform density throughout, so the same density everywhere. It's a property of the object itself. It's the case we care about the most for the center of mass. Oh, we do have a mild notational issue here. If um, suppose we had a, a solid, a variable density. Well, what does x bar, y bar, and z bar mean? Does it mean the coordinates of the center of mass, or does it mean the coordinates of the centroid, like this geometric point? And this won't be an issue much. We'll just be very clear. But um, a lot of people would reserve x bar, y bar, and z bar to mean the coordinates of the centroid. We will always mean if we give a variable density, they will mean the they will mean the coordinates of the center of mass, and if we also want the centroid in that problem, which would be unusual, um, we would just have to state that explicitly and use a different notation. Um, so what are we getting for this? I, I want to make one more comment before we look at three examples. So for instance, what we just saw What we just did was that, okay, you, a little blob of mass is density times a little chunk of volume. The total mass, so M, the total mass, is of course the sum of all the little blobs of mass. So it's the triple integral over S of dm. And then what we're getting is x bar equals 1 over m times the triple integral over s of x dm. And y bar is 1 over m times the triple integral over s of, of y dm. And not surprisingly, z bar is the triple, is 1 over m times the triple integral over s of z dm. So this isn't too bad to remember. This is, these are the coordinates of the center of mass. How many integrals do you have to calculate? Well, sometimes you can use symmetry to know, oh, the x and y coordinates must lie along this axis, or, or the x, y, and z coordinates of the center of mass all have to be the same. Or sometimes you can use symmetry, but if you can't use symmetry, you have to do this integral once and then three other integrals. So you'd have to do four to find coordinates of the center of mass. Um, if delta is constant, so if it's a constant function, then what we were seeing is that, oh, we just get x bar is one over the, the total volume. And the triple integral over s of all the little blobs of volume um, times x. We pulled a delta out of here, you pulled a delta out of there. So um, x times dv and y bar is 1 over the volume times the triple integral over s of y dv. And z bar is 1 over the volume times the triple integral over s of z dv. This is, you need for delta to be constant to pass from kind of having mass here and here to having volume here and here. But I wanted to write this explicitly because you should recognize this. These are just, we've talked about average value. Not surprisingly, x bar, y bar, and z bar, if you look at these and you look back at the definition of average value, the coordinates of the centroid are exactly the average values of the coordinates in the region.
All right, so that's, you know, that's pretty much what you'd expect, hopefully. Um, all right, what else do I want to say before we do examples? We sometimes do this with thin metal plates or thin plates, so two-dimensional objects. In fact, we do it with one-dimensional objects, like very narrow rods, wires, but that's a one-variable calculus problem, and we did that in integral calculus, and so in multivariable calculus, if you want multivariables, you need to do two-dimensional problems or three-dimensional problems. What happens in the, in the uh, two-dimensional case? Well, then a little blob of mass is the area density times a little blab of, blob of area. And then the total mass is, yeah, I usually call regions in the xy plane r. So r times um, dm. And then the x-coordinate of the center of mass, you would just take the double integral over r of x dm divided by the total mass. Y-coordinate, you would take the double integral over, and there wouldn't be a z-coordinate. And if delta is constant, what would you do? Well, then again, the deltas would cancel. Uh, uh, yes. Then again, yeah, the delta ARs would cancel. And here you would get the total area. And here you'd have a DA. And here you'd have, this would be over R. And here you'd have an A. And here you'd have an R. Here you'd have an A. And you wouldn't have this. Again, for the centroid of a region in the plane, this, once again, it's the average value of the x and y coordinates. Just now average value means you're integrating over an area. All right, that's enough general formulas. Let's do three examples. So. So let's do a two-dimensional example first, and then we'll do two three-dimensional examples. So let's just take a right triangle that and you can think of this as a thin plate if you want. Find, find the coordinates of the centroid. All right, well, uh, we'll need an equation for that line, but that line is easily, or that part of a line is, is part of the line y equals b over a times x. It passes through the origin, and when x is a, y is b. I'll call this the region R. We're finding the centroid, so you know, the density is constant. So we're just finding the average value of the x and y coordinates. Certainly, we don't even have to do an integral for the area. That's nice. It's nice when you take geometric objects where you already have formulas for the volumes or the areas. It saves you an integral. Um, it's 1 half the area of a triangle, 1 half the base times the height. So, phew, that was easy. So what do we have to do to find x bar? We take 1 over a. And you multiply it times double integral over s of x times, and it would be dm, except we have constant density, and so we cancel the density, so we have area, not mass. And here we have a dA. All right, um, this is 1 over 1 half ab. And then this is an easy iterated integral to set up. I'll put, it doesn't really matter, I'll put dy on the inside, dx on the outside. x goes from 0 to a. y starts at 0 and goes up to the y coordinate in this line. b over a times x. And we get. So let's see, that first part is the same as 2 over a, b. And the integral from 0, the integral from 0 to a. This is just x times y, so we get x times y, evaluated as y goes from 0 to y equals b over a times x. 
it will still need to integrate with respect to x. We get 2 over AB times the integral from 0 to A of, uh, we just get a B over AX squared. You can bring the B over A out. It'll cancel a B. You'll have a 2 over A squared. You get a 2 over A squared. You integrate X squared. You get X cubed over 3. You evaluate from A to 0. You get an A cubed over 3. So you get 2 thirds A. So that's our X coordinate for the center of mass. It is 2 thirds A. So, you know, roughly around you know, here somewhere. Oh, here's two-thirds A. And we want to find the y-coordinate of the center of mass. Now, you could do it from this because, you know, the problem's kind of symmetric in A and B, except we found it was two-thirds of the way from this vertex that's, you know, far away from the right angle. So what we should find for B, by kind of symmetry of the problem, is that the B coordinate is two thirds away from that vertex towards the right angle, which would mean it would be one third of B. So we're expecting to get one third of B. Let's make sure that we do, but I, we will unless I screw it up. <laughs> so the centroid is like roughly located there. In fact, you may have talked about this in high school, and it's an exercise in the exercises at the end of this section, to show that, in fact, the centroid is located at the point that's the intersection of all of the um, medians of the, the three sides, so that what I'm saying is if you draw a line from this vertex through that point, it'll bisect this side. If you draw a line from this vertex through that point, it'll bisect this side. And if you draw a line through this point, through that vertex and through this point, it'll bisect that side. So the centroid is the common intersection point of all of those medians. Um, but that's an exercise. Well, I'm not going to do that. The, um, all right, let's make sure that we get what we're supposed to get, one third b for the y coordinate. So what changes here? Well, we want y bar. And that means this should be a y. And this should be a y. So now we get So now we integrate y with respect to y. We get y squared over 2. So we get y squared over 2 evaluated from 0 to b over a times x. And then we'll still have to integrate with respect to x. You get 2 over AB. And then the integral from 0 to A of B squared over A squared. Uh, what happened to the 2? Let me, let me put the half outside. 1 half. And then you get times B squared over A squared times X squared DX. All right. You can pull out the half so the 2's cancel. Um, one of the B's will cancel, and you get an A cubed. So we get, just pulling out all this constant stuff, we get a B over A cubed. Is that right? The twos cancel, we left with a B and an A, yes. And then you integrate X squared, you get X cubed over 3, evaluate from A to 0, so you get a times A cubed over 3. The A cubes cancel, and yes, you get one third B, as I said we would. Anyway, that's an easy example of, but an important one, of, of the centroid of a right triangle. All right, let's do a three-dimensional example. One where there's lots of symmetry, so if we calculate one of the coordinates of the center of mass, we'll know all of them. So what's the most symmetric thing you can think of? Well, maybe a sphere, but if we want it to be solid, the ball, so the inside of a sphere of radius r. Of course, that's too symmetric. The answer to the whole problem would be, would be too easy. So, what I'm saying is, if you actually took well, something that looks more like a sphere than that, if you actually took the inside of a sphere of radius r, 
to a ball of radius r, and look for the and look for the centroid. Hopefully, it's blatantly obvious to you where it is. By symmetry, it has to be in the center, because anything that would make it be off the center, if you just kind of wrote, looked at it from a different position, would mean it's someplace else. So yeah, the center of mass. Well, that doesn't look like the center, but the center of mass of a ball is just at the center. That's boring. But what about if we take an eighth of it? So what if we take so take a ball of radius r, but now I just want actually I don't. You draw it slightly differently. I just want the eighth that's in the first octant. So, so let's just draw it like so. We're taking so the eighth of a ball. Radius r centered at the origin. In the first octant. All right. So we'll call this S. You can think part of a sphere, or solid. Okay, so there's our solid, and I'd like to find the centroid. Now, it's no longer at the origin, clearly. But what does symmetry get us? Well, at least the x, y, and z coordinates of the centroid should all be the same. So we know x bar, just by the symmetry of the problem, equals y bar equals z bar, but we have to find one of them, and then we'll know the other two. Another nice thing, we have a geometric formula for the volume, so we don't have to do an integral for the volume. The volume is 1 eighth of the, the volume inside a sphere of radius r, and you, sh you should know that's 4 thirds pi r cubed. Um, so this is 1 sixth. Pi r cubed. But now we have to find, we have to actually do an integral to find at least one of these coordinates of the center of mass. I'm going to find the z coordinate just because we're going to use spherical coordinates. And the z coordinate and spherical coordinates, as you should remember, is kind of the easiest looking one. It's rho cosine of phi. I'll also remind you that, that dv in spherical coordinates is rho squared sine phi d rho d phi d theta. So, our z coordinate of the centroid <coughs> All right, we get z bar z bar is 1 over the volume, which we found to be 1 sixth pi r cubed. And then we need to integrate z times, if we had a variable mass, we'd have dm here, and this would have been the total, we would have had to calculate the total mass out here in a separate integral, but we're assuming a constant, a uniform density, so that we're just calculating the centroid. Um, so we have a ZdV, not a ZdM. And so what we get is, maybe I'll put a V here in this part, but now I'll put, all right, this is 1 6 pi r cubed. Z is rho cosine of phi, dV in spherical coordinates, rho squared, sine phi, d rho, d phi, d theta. To integrate over that eighth of a 
inside of a sphere, or eighth of a ball, uh, theta goes from 0 to pi over 2. Uh, phi goes from 0 to pi over 2. And rho goes from 0 out to the radius of the ball. So this is what we need to calculate. Um, how bad is it? Well, it's not so bad. Um, let me move the, the rho squared times rho. That's a, a rho cubed. So we do this. That inside integral, you get a, a rho to the, when you do this, you get a rho to the fourth over four, and then you put in r for rho and subtract what you get at zero. So you just get an r to the fourth over four multiplied times this times this. Well, we can pull that. Okay, let me invert this six. So we get six over pi r cubed, but we're getting times an r to the fourth over four that we pulled all the way out, and then we have the integral from 0 to pi over 2, the integral from 0 to pi over 2 of cosine phi sine of phi d phi d theta. Uh, this will just be some number, and we can pull that out, and then it will be multiplied times the integral from 0 to pi over 2 of d theta. That's a pi over 2. So we can go ahead and Eliminate that pi over 2 if we want. I'm doing this quickly. We get 6 times, all right. We can cancel in r cubed, and we end up with a 3 halves. So we end up with a, a 3r over pi times 2, over 2 pi. But now I'm pulling out the pi over 2 we get from the theta integral times pi over 2. But we're still left with the integral from 0 to pi over 2 of, and I'm going to write it as sine phi, cosine phi, d phi. But that's an easy integral. All right, here the pi's cancel. You get 3 fourths, you get 3 fourths r, 3 fourths r. And then what? We have to integrate sine of phi, cosine of phi, d phi, not d theta. Well, this is easy. The derivative of sine of phi squared is 2 sine of phi, cosine of phi. So if we just put an extra 2 here, make this 2 sine of phi, cosine of phi, d phi, and divide by another 2 out here, to cancel out the two we multiply by there, we'll get 3 eighths r. And then that integrates to sine squared phi evaluated from 0 to pi over 2. But sine of pi over 2 is 1. So we get 1 squared minus what you get at 0, which is 0. So we get 3 eighths r. So that's our z bar. This is our z bar. But it, by symmetry, it's also our x bar and our y bar. You go out 3 eighths of the way along the radius um, in each coordinate direction. OK, that was <laughs> You may have noticed our problems are coming out fairly simple. That's because I picked simple ones where we have some symmetries, or we have geometric formulas for the area or the volume. Um, of course, these problems could be arbitrarily hard. It just depends on, you know, if you've got a variable density function, how bad it is. Uh, if you've got some bizarre region, how bad the region is. Um, but, yeah, you should start with kind of basic examples. I want to do one more example, and this time we should have the, the density varying. On the other hand, I'm only going to have it varying with one variable, so... That respect, we could have done this in one variable calculus. Um, so we're actually going to know the x and y coordinates by symmetry. I want to take a right circular cylinder of radius r, of height h. I'm going to have it sitting in the xy plane, or have its base in the xy plane. Um, and I'm going to assume that its density, and now it might be nice to pick some units, its density in 
is 1 plus z. This is in you know, kilograms per cubic meter. And x, y, and z are in meters. Now, X, Y, and Z are in meters. Um, of course, that means that our X, Y, and Z coordinates of the center of mass will come out in, in meters. All right. So I'm, I'm assuming, bizarrely, that this object gets more dense as Z gets bigger. So it's more dense at the top. Uh, why that would be, we're just making up a problem, but maybe it's, it's just some metal slug and it's been compressed and it's turned in such a way that it's more dense at the top. So we want to find the x, y, and z coordinates of the center of mass. So find x bar, y bar, and z bar. And this time, the bars mean the center of mass, um, not the centroid. So, all right. What should be clear? Well, the x and y coordinates. This is centered, uh, at least I mean for it to be centered, my picture is not so good, around the z-axis. And the density only depends on z, not on x and y. So you can check, or you can believe it by symmetry, that the x and y coordinates of the center of mass are zero. That the center of mass of this thing is located along the z-axis. It's only the z-coordinate of the center of mass that's in question. Where should the z-coordinate of the center of mass be? Well, closer to the top, closer to where there's more mass. Um, but we need to actually do some calculations to figure that out. So, um, so this, either you can do it as an exercise or you can believe it by symmetry, but we need z-bar. And z-bar is, well, you have to do the triple integral over once again, I'm calling the whole solid S. Is the triple integral over S of Z dm over the triple integral over S of dm. Right? This is the total mass of the object, and then here's the triple integral of Z times the total mass. All right, but this is the triple integral over S of, now we put in our density function, which is 1 plus Z dV. And the same thing down here, the triple integral over S of the density function, 1 plus Z dV, uh, dV. Right, the only difference between these two integrals is that one has an extra Z in it. That's always the, that's always the way in these problems. But that doesn't mean you can somehow cancel the 1 plus z's. You can't do that. When the density function is not constant, you can't just pull it out. You just have to do these two integrals separately. All right? It should come as no surprise that we're going to use cylindrical coordinates. So really, though, I'm going to think of this projected down. And so we're, we're really not going to have to use any coordinates in the xy plane because the projected region is so nice. But um, we have a little problem with what to call the projected region. I don't, I've already used a capital R. I don't want to use A. <coughs> so I'm going to call the projected region, this disk of radius R in the xy plane, I'm going to call that E. Um, and just, it's true we would use cylindrical coordinates, but since we know the area of a circle, we'll see that we don't really have to. We could and quickly get a pi r squared for the area of that circle, or the area inside that circle, but <laughs> we don't really need to. We're getting z bar is, okay, so we just break up dv, right? you write, actually let me write it up here, dv, well, we'll write it as dz times dA, where this is a little blob of area in the xy plane and not commit to whether we're using rectangular coordinates or polar coordinates in the xy plane because it won't matter. So right now we've got z bar is the triple integral well over s but the projected region is e and then inside e I mean for each point in e the z coordinate is going from 0 up to the height 
of the cylinder. And then you've just got um, z times 1 plus z dz dA. Right? So we do, right? we took our triple integral over s, the projected region is E. For each point in our projected region, the z coordinate goes from 0 to h, our integrand was z times 1 plus z. And so this is what you get in the denominator. You get the same thing, except you're missing that z right there. So you get the integral from 0 to h of 1 plus z dz, and then again times dA. But this is just going to be a function of h. It, it, I mean, it's just going to depend on h. We're going to integrate with respect to z. We'll get and we'll plug in h. It's a constant. And you'll pull it out, and what you'll be left with is that constant times the double integral over the region E, which is a disk of radius r, dA. Well, that's the area of a disk of radius r. And you get the same thing down here, but the constant you pull out will be different. So what are we getting? What I'm saying is you get a, a pi r squared times the integral from 0 to h of z plus z squared dz divided by a pi r squared times the integral from 0 to h of just 1 plus z dz. The pi r squareds cancel, which is nice. When you integrate this, you get z squared plus z cubed. Uh, let's try that again. You get z squared over 2 plus z cubed over 3, evaluated from 0 to h, but that just means you get h squared over 2, plus h cubed over 3. And you divide by, well, when you integrate this, you get z plus z squared over 2, and then evaluate from 0 to h, you get h plus h squared over 2. And that's the z coordinate of the center of mass. Now, <laughs> it doesn't look very nice. Uh, we can certainly cancel an h everywhere if we want. And w w if we want to make the numerators and denominators look nicer, I guess we cancel an h and multiply through by a 6. So I will get, uh, I'm multiplying the numerator and denominator by 6 and canceling an h everywhere. So I get 3h plus 2h squared over... 6 plus 3h, right? If I did that right, I canceled an h everywhere, and I multiplied through by 6 in the numerator and denominator. Yes, that looks good. If we're doing everything right, surely the center of mass <laughs> should end up somewhere between 0 and h, between the bottom of the cylinder and the top of the cylinder. Now, this is clearly greater than 0, is it less than h? It might be a little difficult to tell. So now that I canceled an h, I'm about to put one back. I'm going to write, I'm going to multiply the denominator by h, but put an h outside. So why on earth would I do this? Times h. So I multiplied the denominator by an h, but then I put an h out here. Well, I'd like to see what fraction of the height we're getting for the center of mass. Well, here's the fraction of the height that we're getting. And clearly, the denominator is bigger than the numerator, right? This part is twice that, and this part, this part has an extra h squared. So this is certainly less than 1. So yeah, we're getting some fraction of h. So it's some, some fraction less than 1 of h. So yes, this number is between 0 and h. Um, when h is... If h is very small, so that, in, so that h squared is even smaller, if h were very small, this would roughly be a half h. Well, that's not surprising. If the height of the cylinder is very small, yeah, you, it, so that the, the density isn't changing much, you would expect roughly that the center of mass is at the center. So, it, you know, halfway, halfway up, so half of h. However, what you should notice is, as h gets very big, then h squared matters more than h. And then it's like, these don't matter. Then the h squareds cancel, and this is like 2 thirds of h. So as h gets large, the z coordinate of the center of mass moves closer to the top, as promised. It's closer to 2 thirds 
of the height of the cylinder instead of, instead of being halfway up. Um, those, are, those were some quick, easy examples of center of mass. Um, in the next section, we're going to look at something that seems related, but um, is significant, is really quite different. We're going to look at bodies that are revolving or rotating about an axis and look at something called the moment of inertia.